my former professors, a professor by the name of Jim Byerly, and I talked to Mary about it. We're pretty sure that they're not um, relatives, at least close relatives. Maybe somewhere in the past, maybe they're related to somebody generations and generations ago, but Jim was one of my favorite professors. He taught psychology, he taught music. In fact, the first guitar I ever bought um, Kelly, he had taken it and repaired it. And, and I, I, I gave it to her. We didn't have a lot of money back then. We were poor Bible college students, but he repaired it. And it's Kelly's favorite guitar. In fact, we still have it today. But anyway, he sent this post, and this is what he said. He said, I don't think that I've ever dreamed of dying, but that was the content the other night. I can't remember what led up to the part when I died, but I do remember knowing that I was dying, and then I was passing through, and this is the part that's hard to explain. Something like a silvery mist and was traveling upward in light. I was not afraid, but simply being carried along until the next segment when I met a man in, I think, a tan suit or a sport coat who was going to shake my hand and welcome me, but something hindered him. Then I was jolted back to reality and on my back in bed and gasped for a breath, and I was awake. You know, I've, feared, I've had a fear of death, but the calm that followed the dream was what impressed me and also gave me a new perspective on death. It was natural, nothing out of the ordinary, and seemed like just the next step in what was going on in my life. The dream could have come from my longing for answers, and it could have come from God. But no matter what it was, it will linger for some time to come. And I am more at peace with death now, simply because of the dream. And then he says this. He says, and I better look into a CPAP machine. <laughs> in case you don't know what a CPAP machine is, a breathing machine, like a mask, and a machine that people have to wear who have a problem with stopping breathing in the middle of the night. In fact, if you've ever watched Deadliest Catch, one of the deckhands uh, during the summer died because he stopped breathing, and so it's really important. Now, I want to say this. If, and I repeat if, this was what some might refer to as a near-death experience, it was calming for Jim for one reason and one reason only, and that's because of his faith in Jesus. You see, it's faith in Jesus and nothing else that gets us into heaven. What does Jesus say in John 14, 6? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to me or no one comes to the Father except through me. Yeah. Through who? Me. Through me, through Jesus. And so we're going to be talking about faith this morning. Let's go ahead and turn to 1 Peter. We're going to be in the first chapter this morning, and we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 9. Can I get everyone to please stand? I know with all that Thanksgiving meal you had, it might be a little bit tougher to get up today. Beginning in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, <clears throat> to attain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith. Through what? Faith. Through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is imperishable, even though tested by fire, which is, I'm sorry, perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but you believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Let me say that again. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you so much for your word. 
Lord, people tell us things and we hear things and sometimes we get confused. Sometimes we get confused with what's real and what's unreal. We get confused with, with what people are saying. Sometimes they don't even say the same thing. But Lord, we want to hear what you have to say. Because it doesn't really matter what anyone else says. What it matters is what you say, Father God. And so, Father God, I'm praying that you will speak to us this morning. That you will teach us this morning how to protect our faith. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Now, we put our money in the bank to protect it. Amen? Amen? The government puts its gold in Fort Knox to protect it. <clears throat> Priceless paintings are put in museums with not only state-of-the-art security systems, but also with armed guards. Let me just say this. Things of value should be protected. Amen? Do you agree with that? Yes. Things of value should be protected. Now, let me make this clear. Nothing is more valuable than your faith. Verse 7 says that your faith, or at least the proof of your faith, is more valuable than gold. Amen? Amen. And the reason why it's more valuable than gold, the reason it's more valuable than anything else you have, is because it's the only thing you can take with you, and it's also the only thing that can get you into heaven. And so we should do what? We should protect our faith at all costs. And so today that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, <coughs> excuse me, I got that itch again on my throat. We're going to talk about protecting your faith. Have you ever wondered why people leave the church and then eventually leave the faith? I want to say this, I purposely put those two together, leaving the church and leaving faith. Somebody once told me that when, when, when a person leaves the church, they're kind of like a cell phone without a battery charger. I mean, they leave and they're okay for a while, but eventually their faith battery runs dead. Amen? Amen. Now, let me just say this as well. We need to understand that if we are going to protect our faith, there are several things that we need to do. If we're going to protect our faith, there are several things that we need to do. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that we're going to church. Amen? Amen. We need to make sure that we don't give up because if we give up, what's going to happen? Eventually, our faith batteries are going to run dead. And so we, we go to church, but the other thing we do is we don't just go to church. We get connected with other people in the church. In fact, one of the things I want to challenge the church today, all of you, is that when people come in, I want you to, to make connections with them. One of the reasons that we lose people is because they don't feel connected. And so it's not enough that you're connected with each other. we got to make sure that when the new people come in, that we bring them into the family. Amen? Amen. We've got to make sure that we do that. Um, the other thing you have to understand is that there is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. You think that you're wrong. You realize that even the Lone Ranger was not alone? He had Tano, didn't he? <clears throat> now the word for, for church in the Greek is the word ekklesia. And ekklesia doesn't mean a building. And so this building is not the church. The word ekklesia means the gathering. And so the gathering of people who believe in Jesus. And so the church is not the building the church is us. The church is you and me. We are the gathering. Amen. Over in Hebrews 10.25 it says, <clears throat> Not forsaking our own assembly together, <clears throat> as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know what? It's really not uncommon for people to misinterpret the 10th chapter of Hebrews especially verses 26 and 29, which say, For if we go on sinning willfully and receiving, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And then verse 29 says, How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant, by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace. 
And so verse 26 says that willful sin, willful sin means no sacrifice for sin. It means no forgiveness. In other words, it means no salvation. And so if that verse is talking about willful sins, then every one of us here this morning is in trouble. And that's because almost every sin that you and I commit is willful. I mean, you don't accidentally have an affair with somebody else. You don't accidentally lust after a man or a woman. You don't accidentally cheat on a test. You don't accidentally judge your brother. You don't accidentally lie about something. And so every time you and I sin, it is a willful choice that we make. I'll be honest, the first time I read those verses, they scared me to death. And that's because I did not know the context of the book of Hebrews. I thought it was talking about sins like getting drunk and doing drugs and having affairs and lying and stealing and cheating and all the other sins that are common to men, all of the other sins that we commit. But that is not what these verses are about. It's not about sins. It's about a single sin. It's about a willful choice. You know, in college and seminary, I was taught to always look at the context of a book. Remember we talked about that last week? Context is king. Context determines the meaning of the word. And so the context of the book of Hebrews isn't that these people were turning to the world and all of its sin. No, the context of the book of Hebrews is that these Jewish Christians were turning back to Judaism and turning their backs on Jesus because of persecution. If you study the first century, you know that the church suffered great persecution. And these Hebrew Christians were being thrown in prison and their property was being confiscated simply because they were followers of Jesus. In fact, look at verse 34 in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. It says, For you showed sympathy to the prisoners, and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. And so let me say this one more time. The people were not immoral. That was not the problem. The problem is that they were turning their backs on Jesus because of persecution. That's the willful sin that they were committing. <laughs> That's how they were trampling underfoot the blood of God, the Son of God. That's how they were regarding as unclean the blood of the covenant that was sacrificed for them. I mean, let me explain something. I want you to have that image of, of trampling the, the blood of the Son of God underfoot. When we have something that we don't value, we tend to do what well with it? We throw it away. When we think something is useless, we get rid of it. And so that's how they were viewing Jesus' sacrifice. The blood of Jesus as if it had no value at all. That's how they were trampling underfoot the blood of Jesus. They insulted the spirit of grace by turning back to law as a means of salvation instead of relying on grace, which comes through faith in Jesus. Besides, the Bible's clear, all sins are forgivable except one. All sins are forgivable except one, and that is rejecting Jesus. Jesus says this in Mark 3, verses 28 through 30. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men. What did he say? All sins shall be forgiven the sons of men. And whoever blas and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And so Jesus says that all sins will be forgiven except one: blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You know, when you read that at first, you kind of go. Why? Why is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit worse than blasphemy of God or blasphemy of Jesus? It's because of what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was all about. 
fact, the last verse there tells us what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. It says, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And to help you make more sense of that, you have to understand that everything Jesus did was under the power of the Holy Spirit. Every person he raised from the dead was under the power of the Holy Spirit. Every crippled person that he made to walk again was under the power of the Holy Spirit. Every leper that he cleansed was under the power of the Holy Spirit. Every sick person that was healed was under the power of the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of these miracles that, that Jesus performed were to prove that his message was true. To prove that he was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. The Lamb of God who would come, down, come and lay down his life for our sins. And so when they blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, what they were doing was rejecting Jesus. They were rejecting the testimony of the Holy Spirit through these miracles to prove what Jesus said was true. And so in essence, like I said, they were rejecting Jesus. And so there is only one sin that is unforgivable. That is the rejection of Jesus. That was the problem in the book of Hebrews as well. They were rejecting Jesus and they were walking away from their faith. And as long as those people who left the church, as long as they continued to reject Christ, there could be no salvation. There could be no forgiveness of sins. Why? Because Jesus was the means of forgiveness. And if you reject the means, guess what? There is no salvation. And so they were, some were willfully walking away from Jesus when they walked away from the church. And so the author of Hebrews wanted them to understand the consequences of doing so. Yeah, things were tough. It's tough to be put in prison. It's tough to lose your property. But they were paying a much higher price by walking away from their faith. Amen? And so the point is, if you want to protect your faith, you need to be in church. You see, church is the one place that your faith is safe. Today, there's so many things working against your faith in the world. Every day, your faith is under attack. Every day on, the, on TV, it's under attack. Every day in the public school, it's under attack. Every day in the universities, it's under attack. Every day, even in some of our workplaces, it's under attack. But let me tell you something. Your faith is always safe in the church. Amen. Not only is your faith safe in the church, it's also being strengthened. You see, when you are here learning and growing, guess what else is growing? Your faith is growing. And that's why you need to be in the church. The second way you, would, you protect your faith is by reading your Bible. Now this is a no-brainer. I shouldn't even have to preach this. I think we all know it, right? But do we do it? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we, we definitely don't read the Bible as much as we should. I'm pretty sure that none of us do it as much as Roger does. Roger read, has read the Bible last time I heard five times through this year already. I haven't done that. I don't know if any of you have, but I know I haven't done that. But I think the truth is none of us, with maybe the exception of Roger, have read the Bible as much as we should. And so to protect your faith, I'm going to challenge every one of you this morning to get involved with our Read Through the Bible uh, campaign starting in January of 2019. And let me challenge you. Some of you are going, well, I don't want to start something I don't think I can finish. Do as much as you can. Even if you don't get the whole Bible read in a year, do as much as you can, because I can guarantee this, you're going to read the Bible more by doing that than if you don't. Now, the other thing I want to challenge you is to remember the purpose of the Bible, of reading it, isn't just for information, it's for transformation. And so we need to read the Bible, not, so that, not only so that we can know about God, but also so that we can be transformed and our faith can grow. And then God can use us in greater ways. Amen? Another way you protect your faith is praying. And, and I know, prayer is one of those habits that's really hard to get going. Sometimes it's hard to keep going. And that, that's because it's hard to pray to somebody that you cannot see. But you know what? That's what faith is all about. If we could see God, guess what? We wouldn't need any faith, would we? 
I like how the author talks in verse 8, when he's talking to him, he says, And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him. And you see, that's what faith is. Now one of the challenges is when we pray, most of us aren't going to have a burning bush experience. I think I can't do that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of us will not experience a burning bush moment where God speaks to us through a burning bush. But that doesn't mean God doesn't speak to us. Sometimes God speaks to us in whispers. Sometimes God will just put an impression in our minds and, and we know it's from Him. Sometimes we'll get a word from God as we're reading the Bible, which is why we need to read the Bible. Sometimes God will confirm something that God's put on our heart through another Christian. And sometimes God will just speak to us through a situation. Let me give you an example of how God did that in my life. A little bit over nine years ago, I was looking for a ministry. And I was praying to God that he would send me to the right ministry. Because I knew if I followed where he led, that would be the right ministry for me. And so I was praying, and I actually checked this church out. And I didn't come here to Sweet Home. I got on the internet. And I found a church on the internet in Sweet Home that had our name. And I looked it up, and it was a non-instrumental church. Which means they don't believe in musical instruments in the church. And I thought, well, that's a non-starter for me. My wife's a music major, you know. And I thought, well, forget it. I just had written it off. And so there was no chance of me coming here. I went to Boise in May, and out of the blue, Dr. Crane came up to me. And some of you know Dr. Crane pretty well. Dr. Crane grew up in this church. Graduated, Graduated here in Sweet Home, even. Well, the reason I know Dr. Crane is because Dr. Crane was a president of Boise Bible College when I went there. And so Dr. Crane came up to me and said, Dale, have you ever thought about going to Sweet Home? And I said, yeah, I kind of looked at it, but they're non-instrumental, so you know, I'm not going there. And he said, no, they're not. He goes, you must be thinking about the wrong church. Because, because this one's got a grand piano in it. And so I called Kelly and had her send a resume out right away, but I, I'm going to be honest with you. If God had not made that divine appointment where Dr. Crane had come to talk to me, I wouldn't be here. But that's the power of prayer. That's why we need to pray, because God will guide us and direct us. Now, the other thing that I really felt powerful about and, and knew that God was, was wanting me to be here and wanted this church to survive was because of a gift that came in Actually, before I even got here, many of you may remember Dorothy Roth. She used to come here, and when she died, she left $50,000 to this church. And that came at a time when other people were telling you guys, let this church die. Let it die. Just donate it to one of those uh, church uh, startup groups, you know. Um, and, but when I, when, I, when I heard that, when I you know, knew, put everything together, I knew that God was calling me to be here. And that, that not only um, strengthened my faith in prayer, it strengthened my faith, period. Because you know something? Every time you see God move, every time you see God speak to you, that does what? That strengthens your faith. Amen? And when your faith gets stronger, guess what? It is more protected. Amen? You've got four lines of defense and you add another line of defense, guess what? It's harder to get through, isn't it? It's harder for the devil to win. So we've got to protect our faith. We've got to protect our faith. Now the last way that you protect your faith is by not having unrealistic expectations of God. I mean, if you believe that when you become a Christian that you're never going to have any problems or trials or tribulations ever again, let me just tell you this, you've been misinformed. That is not the Christian life here on earth. In fact, verses 5 and 6 makes it clear that God will protect us and get us to heaven, but that we are destined to have trials and tribulations and tragedies and troubles on this planet. And one thing I've learned about the trials and tribulations, and maybe you have too, 
is that during the trials and tribulations, God does his greatest work on us. Sometimes I, I just know that I would not be the man that I am today if it wasn't for the trials and tribulations that I go through. And so God didn't tell us that he's going to protect us from trials and tribulations because he uses those things. One thing that God has promised, though, is that he will protect us from the devil trying to keep us from going to heaven. He says, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So it says right there that God's going to protect us for salvation. And then he says this. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. You know, one thing that absolutely breaks my heart, and I'm sure it breaks God's heart as well, is when people come to church, they accept Christ, but then when they face a trial or a tribulation, they give up. They walk away. Maybe someone dies. Maybe someone has a divorce. Maybe someone loses their job. Maybe someone has a financial problem. Or maybe one of the thousand other tragedies that strike at the human heart. And so they think to themselves, this faith thing isn't working. This faith thing isn't working. And, and it's what I've been talking about. It's, it's because they've got the wrong impression of what God promises. God doesn't promise us that we will not have problems on this earth. But he does promise that he will get us safely to heaven. See, the problem that a lot of Christians have is they think that earth is heaven. So that's the problem that a lot of Christians have. They think that earth is heaven. That somehow we're not going to have any problems on, on earth. But that's not earth. That's heaven. In fact, a little bit later, in 1 Peter 4.12, Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that has come upon you, as though something strange were happening to you. And so trials are not abnormal. They're not strange. They're normal. They will be abnormal in heaven. They will be strange in heaven, but not on earth. And so if you want to protect your faith, you won't have a Pollyanna view of life, whereas a Christian you expect not to have any problems. You see, trials will come. Christians will die just like non-Christians will die. The truth is all of us will die someday. Christians will, fight, will face heartbreak and heartache just like non-Christians will face heartache and heartbreak. But here's the difference. The difference is we are not alone. God is with us. And when we cannot carry ourselves, He will carry us. I said, when we cannot carry ourselves, He will carry us, even if that means carrying us to the other side. Talking about carrying someone to the other side, I don't know how many of you have heard the story of the Christian missionary who was going to one of these isolated indigenous islands to try to reach the people of that island for Christ. This was an island where nobody from the outside world had made, successfully made contact with them. In fact, some fishermen actually landed on this island and they were murdered. But he loved those people so much. And he loved God so much that he tried to witness to him. His name was John Allen Chow. In this video right now, it's going to go ahead and tell his story. <coughs> had been killed on an island off the coast of India. Indian authorities believe 26-year-old John Allen Chow was murdered by members of a tribe on a remote island he had visited. They say the tribe has been known to shoot outsiders with bows and arrows, and now the Indians are struggling to figure out how to recover his body. Senior Foreign Affairs correspondent Amy Kellogg live from Milan with more. Hi, Amy. 
Hi, Leland. Well, not only is it dangerous to approach this tribe, but it's really complicated so much so that regional police have employed some specialist anthropologists to help uh, get to these people. They've got to conduct a murder investigation, after all, with a totally remote tribe. And then also, as you mentioned, try to get that body. I mean, some fishermen several years back approached the island inadvertently. They drifted on shore. They were killed. And then um, these North Sentinelese tribesmen shot at helicopters back in 2004 uh, that were coming to rescue them after the Indian Ocean tsunamis. Now, the Reuters news agency quoted a source who was familiar with notes that John Allen Chow had written saying, quote, don't blame the natives if I am killed. He had long been bound and determined to reach the people of North Sentinel Island, which sits at the intersection of the Bay of Bengal and the Andaman Sea. This is a tribe said to date back to the Stone, Age, Stone Ages, and India is fiercely protective of it. It's generally forbidden to approach the North Sentinelese, and taking pictures or making videos of them uh, is punishable by three years in prison. Chow apparently approached them, saying, quote, my name is John, I love you, Jesus loves you. He was taken close to the island by some fishermen he employed to transport him, and then approached the island alone by kayak. The Sentinel he shot at him with arrows when he got near to them. He turned back and tried again the next day in Leland. That is when he was said to have been uh, killed. These fishermen who helped him out, who helped him get close to the island, said that they saw from a distance some of the tribesmen dragging Chow's body away. The parents of the family of John, uh, John Allen Chow today issued a statement on Instagram saying that they actually do forgive whoever killed Chow. Leland, back to you. Wow. All right. Amy Kellogg in Milan. Amy, thank you. Now, we've heard of other stories of missionaries going. In fact, I remember there were husbands and wives in one story, and all the husbands were murdered by a tribe. And then you know what their wives did? They went to the tribe, and they loved them, and they led them to Christ. But the thing I thought was really, really important is that John Allen Chow had written to his parents, and he said, if I die, do not be angry at God. And that's a lesson for each and every one of us. When something goes wrong in our lives, we don't get angry at God. Why? Because earth is not heaven. Let me say that again. Earth is not heaven. Heaven is our home, and let's make sure that we get there. Let's make sure that we get to heaven. And so how do we do that? We do that by protecting our faith. And the way we protect our faith is by going to church, reading our Bibles, praying, and just as importantly, not having unrealistic expectations of God. That's how we protect our faith.